The Lance Wall Now Show is coming at you live from the master himself, with a special broadcast taken from one of Lance's most recent appearances. Tune in and get ready for some major revelation. So let me uh, let me say this. You know, Andrew and I, it, interesting, if you study convergence, which is what I'd love to talk about, and I think I'm going to probably get this course somehow in uh, to Karis, is I coach Christians to go become peak performers in the domain that God assigned to them. Now, let me say to a lot of you out there, something I've noticed about a lot of my tribe here that, that overlaps so well with wealth builders and we carry, to engage this world and this world system. We have become infatuated with Jesus. We love God. And we want with all our heart and soul to be able to go into that direction. I myself, you may think, you know, that that I'm a smart person because I'll use words now and then that will impress people, but the reality forming student with a learning disability. And I was flunking out of every school I was ever in. And when I got saved, I found out in James that if any man lacks wisdom, now if you've been mocked your whole life for being stupid, you can't graduate. My father's a lawyer and an engineer. Two brothers of mine are professors. I'm just really stupid. And uh, when I found out in the book of James that you could pray for wisdom, I mean, that's like giving a desperate man, you know, it's like, it's like some emaciated guy with no, no body, you know, suddenly he can look like Captain America. I, my biggest desire was I prayed to God with concepts and ide ideas and communication is because God gave me an answer to that prayer. He gave me wisdom. And I'm, so I'm saying that. Now, you could say, now, if it's a healing gift, people could see it. And if it's, uh, you know, prosperity, people can see it. But somehow people feel awkward about saying, oh, yeah, God gave me wisdom. But it's true. And I know that because of the stupid things I can do when I'm not operating in wisdom. <laughs> I can't ask my wife about that. I can't find a car in a parking lot. But I could tell you how to do what God called you to do and do it with accuracy. I can tell you how to build a business. I can tell you how to get elected. And what Andrew is in our field of what we call leadership emergence theory. This is a theory that I taught in a master. I actually teach it in college and university. I taught it in a master's degree class uh, with Bobby Clinton, who is a student of Fuller Theological Seminary, who studied this, this concept, which I want to just drop on you real quick. It's, just a, it's probably, I don't know if it's going to be, a, it's probably a third year concept for Karis, but it probably could be in the first year. And it's that convergence theory says that God designed you with certain gifts, talents, and abilities so that you have an assignment or a calling that matches your design. And in the area where you lack, such as me, intellectual capacity, you can see God and God will augment your natural capacity with a supernatural acumen to complement you so that even though you may seem in the natural like you can't do it, God will give you by grace the ability to do what you cannot do. Your gifts, talents, and abilities, plus the supernatural enablement of God, produces a, a, a capacity for convergence. Convergence is when you're doing the thing God created you to do. And the research that Bobby Clinton had, 20% of the body of Christ actually gets into convergence. That's 20%, not of mankind, but 20% of Christians seeking to fulfill their destiny. 80% don't get there. 20% do. And he based that on the fact that he interviewed people that were peak performers in their assigned field to see whether or not they felt they were doing what God had called them to do. And, or he just interviewed, you know, basically he had Fuller Theological Seminary, so he had a large cadre of people. He observed Rick Warren in pastoring, John Maxwell in leadership development. All these people were students that Clinton was a student with, and he was studying leadership emergence theory. I'm saying that because Andrew Womack is what you call a stylized practitioner. That means it's one of a kind that doesn't come off the mold of somebody else's printing press. They created their own unique brand identity. Stylized practitioner. But what you are is what you attract. Not surprisingly, he will attract a tribe of stylized practitioners. That means what you're called to do probably doesn't have an exact model for you to follow, but if you follow the principles that he's working with, you'll find your own style and your own field to practice in. Does that make sense? Now, I know that because I'm a stylized practitioner. Nobody in any of the revival circles I was in ever wanted, ever, ever, I was never invited to the party. I always felt like an odd duck. 
Everybody else is like all about revival, revival, revival. I'm talking seven mountains. They're talking about going to heaven. I'm talking about occupying planet Earth. And it's like really weird. They're talking about revival. I'm talking about Donald Trump. Keep an eye on media. Fake news, fake news. Watch what happens. This guy's a wrecking ball. Cyrus, Gaza, you better keep an eye on government. Government control. I could. I was talking about something no revival community wanted to talk about. But then after I proved to be right, I was invited to all their events. <laughs> Figure that one out. But then I was too hot to handle. Because when you're a stylized practitioner, you're hoping that your peers will love you, but they didn't get you here, so you're not looking for their approval to keep you here. So what you're pursuing is convergence. But the, the, thing, the thing that makes Anna, uh, Annabelle, the thing that makes, uh, huh? You're on my mind, honey, yes. <laughs> my wife, she is one of the most unusual people you'll ever meet. She gets more excited during offerings at other people's ministries. She's so excited about the giving here in these meetings that I feel like I'm disappointing her if I don't pick a big number. Because she won't, she goes, are you getting a number? Now, I'll be honest with you, this is going to reveal a little intimate moment here. I said last night, I said, five. She goes, five. And I knew right away, I overshot the runway. I said, 500. She goes, she thought it was 5,000. My gosh, that's you should be married to that every day. You see, I feel always convicted, like I'm being stingy, and I'm giving more than I ever gave in my life. I'm coming along. Tell you what. But you know, I had a, I had a, grand, I had a grandma and aunt used to say, as God made them, he matched them. That was what she used to say. And like Annabelle, for me, was the perfect match for me because I could be very Jewish and very intellectual and very cerebral. And I could, you know, you see things and you can got to get morose about it because that tends to be a very Jewish thing. You're looking at the, you know, which is why Jewish people are so funny because they have a great sense of irony because they deal with so much tragedy that everything's funny. Because the, when you think about it, what is comedy? But it's the unexpected. So Jews are good at the unexpected. But like with my wife, I knew that we were perfectly matched when I was driving with her when we were first dating. Were we married when I did this? And I said, and I was just thinking about something and it was bothering me and it was making me a bit irritable. She said, what's wrong with you? She's all happy and bubbly. I said, nothing. She goes, well, no, no, something's wrong with you. I go, well, I'm just kind of, eh, I don't know, I feel a little bit irritable. She goes, ibibu? I go, irritable. She goes, what's ibibu? I go, ibibu, what are you talking about ibibu? And that's when the Lord said, I have designed her so that she doesn't buy into any of your carnal plants. <laughs> she'll just be a, she'll be a disruption. But I'm saying that because a lot of you are very, you're stylized practitioners. You're eccentric, like we are, like my wife, me. Uh, stylized practitioners, you know, how many of you really feel like you never really fit in the crowd? Just put your hand, look at that. There's your, look at that. It's like a Nuremberg rally right there. Hallelujah. <laughs> So, uh, so many of us just didn't fit in, in the crowds that we were in. And, and so, but I want to, I want to caution you on this. I was just like you in this sense. I was the rich young ruler who left it all. I didn't realize this until Ed Silvoso told me once at Lance, you know, the rich young ruler. I, oh, you know, he was right. I was raised, vice president of an oil company raised me, uh, lawyer, engineer. I was a bit of a disappointment because the one thing that I really wanted to do was theater. <laughs> that was my goal in life, which is, which is kind of odd when you think about it. And I, I, wanted, I, just, I was fascinated by entertainment as a field. I thought if I wasn't saved, I just wanted to do entertainment. So uh, my dad thought that wasn't a serious profession and certainly not a way to make a living. So, so he was really trying to straighten me out, he sent me to a military school. Because I, was, I had terrible grades, D's and F's, sent me to a military academy, which you got to understand, man, military academy, when you're like 15, 16, 17, 18, it's, it's, it's hell. It's like Paris Island for three years. It's Lord of the Flies, if you ever read the book. So, so I, I'm, I'm in the military. I was so desperately miserable in a structured military environment where people with no hair yelling at you all the time. That, um, but it was good for me in this sense. It drove me to such desperation that I cried out, oh God, if there is a God in the universe, reveal yourself to me. 
And one night on that campus, uh, uh, a long-haired Jesus freak comes on campus, wanders onto the campus with four spiritual laws, stands right outside my barracks. I'm coming back to my barracks, and there's a pack of people ready to pack snowballs and throw them in. He's got a poor guy with him over there, and they're throwing snowballs at him. And I see this one guy, and I came up to him. I said, oh, my gosh, what are you doing here? He goes, well, and he starts sharing the gospel with me. I thought, what a loser. If I had long hair and jeans, I'd be out there partying with girls. I wouldn't be stuck on this island over here where I'm at. You're actually coming here in your free time. I'm trying to get out of here. So I thought, oh my gosh, he's a religious fanatic. I said, well, what, what, do you, what do you got? What do you got? He starts witnessing to him at the four spiritual laws. And now what's really weird is I've got a pack of wolves around me, all these little cadets and angry young men that want to be just like me, want to get out of there. And there's these people that represent freedom, jeans and long hair. And they're pummeling that guy with snowballs. And this guy's talking to me. I thought, you guys see this is getting out of hand here. I'm really, for your sake, you ought to leave. And the guy goes, no, no, well, uh, he goes, no, I, I, I'd rather talk to you. And at that moment, out of the second story window of Frank Fiermonte's room, I can still remember it, uh, the most demonized cadets we had somehow gathered. It was like all the demons were showing up. And they had a window and they took a, a garbage can full of water and dumped it out and it hit the guy evangelizing me, and I jumped back like this. Now, he's soaking wet, standing there in the middle of freezing cold uh, Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, where George Washington, you know, barracks in the freezing cold snow. That was where our military academy was. He's soaking wet in Valley Forge Military Academy campus. There's snow, like, you know, several inches deep. And he looks at me with absolute equanimity, poise, and says, this uh, message has resulted in the martyrdom, the drowning, the crucifying, the burning alive of witnesses for 2,000 years. I'm willing to talk to you if you're willing to listen. <laughs> well, all of a sudden, this guy went from being a long-haired religious freak that I felt sorry for to being like, uh, who the heck are you? I mean, I'm in a military academy where they teach leadership. That guy had more courage, conviction, character, and leadership in his long-haired gene condition than I had. I said, oh, man, I could see right away. I'm starting to come under the influence of this movement. I said, all right, all right, all right, show me what you got. <laughs> he shows me, and then he says to me these words. So he shows me the, you know, the decision I have to make about accepting Jesus. I look up at him, I go, I look at the crowd there packing balls, snowballs, going, what's the wall now? What's he doing? I go, you want me to pray with you? He goes, yeah. I go, here? He goes, yeah. In front of them? He goes, yes. And at that moment, and it took that moment, I realized I wasn't a Christian. Because a lot of people think they're Christians that aren't Christians. I mean, how do you know you're not a Christian until you actually get convicted? People grew up in America. I know I wasn't a Hindu or a Buddhist. So I figured I'm a Christian. My dad was Jewish and raised me as an Episcopalian. And that's confusing right there. So I, uh, but I didn't know he was Jewish back then. So I said, okay. So I prayed haltingly, not courageously, but I prayed enough, with enough courage that the grace of God met me and I got born again then. Now how I know I got born again is thank God I, got, I, I had an experience. You don't have to have an experience because you get saved by faith, but thank God I had an experience because something came into me, right into here, boom, and reverberated all throughout my whole body. And I stepped back like that. I blinked and I looked at him and I go, what was that? He said, Jesus just came into your heart. I said, oh my gosh, I thought it was like a poetry thing. Like you come in, like God's in my heart, my mother's in my heart, Jesus in my heart. He actually came into me. He said, yes, that's exactly what happens. You got born again. I go, this is crazy, man. I didn't expect an experience. <laughs> so the poor other guy's getting whacked with snowballs. And I said, look, you don't understand this. I mean, it's, 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 uh, I'm concerned about you guys. And at that moment, the military police came. We had military police. And they grabbed my two evangelists. And the guy says to me, the last thing he says to me is, I can see you're going to need some discipling. I said, you don't understand it. It's a miracle you got on the campus. We've got armed guards at every gate. This is like a penal column. How do you got here? I don't know. <laughs> but I don't think you're going to be coming back again. And, I, and that guy took off. They dragged him off. I could see his heel marks in the snow as they took him out on the horizon. And I'm standing there with a four spiritual laws track in my hand. I was totally lost with a four spiritual laws track. To this day, I never met that guy again. But he was a faithful witness that got me saved. And I've been to like 70 nations and all around the world. 
with the instability happening in the market right now and with inflation going up in the dollar and, and it's like seems to be like in its free fall, we're watching the stock market make some terrible um, reckoning adjustments. And where are people going? Well, when cash is, is unstable, people put their money in a store of value, gold and silver and precious metals. What I didn't know till recently, and I should have known it, is that you can take your 401k and you can actually convert it uh, and put it into an account that has silver and gold. That means that your 401k retirement savings is going to be in silver and gold. So as the dollar starts to uh, get unstable or decline, your gold and silver value is guarding your retirement. Now, this is the tax-exempt strategy that Birch Gold uh, can advise you on. You want to go to LanceWallet.com forward slash Birch. Talk to one of their consultants, download their report, and learn how you can convert a 401k or your retirement plan into gold and silver accounts secure and protect your money and have peace of mind. LanceWallet.com forward slash Birch. Download the report. Talk to the consultant. There's no obligation. That's what I'm recommending people do. I go home. And my dad, and right away, now I'm a religious fanatic. I mean, my dad sent me to military school to get straightened out, and I come home born again Jesus freak. <laughs> he was really concerned. He thought I needed deprogramming. I said, I don't think there's a program that's going to fix this, Dad. Anyway, I go off to college, and I didn't fit in college, secular university, you can imagine. But I was good at, I, was, I actually got kicked out of the university because we had a revival. I was getting guys saved and filled with the Spirit. We had a prayer meeting in Lancaster County, Manheim, Pennsylvania. We go out there to that prayer meeting, come back. And so I ended up getting accused of starting a cult on campus and taking advantage of the nervous condition of, of students during final exams. <laughs> Somehow God put me with a sense of uh, irony this, you know, me, I'm not the athletic type. The one thing on my wife's list of what she wanted in a man, you know, funny, right, this, all stuff, but then it was like athletic. She said, well, you can't get everything. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm entertaining. <laughs> anyway. So, so anyway, anyway so, so, I got, so I'm, I'm off to uh, off the college. They, they kicked me out of the college because they said I was starting a cult. And I understand why that rumor started. I had a military uh, uniform. I, I, one of the really cool pieces of attire in a military school is the, is the raincoat. I don't know if you remember what these look like, but like West Point has them. It's like this rubber on the outside. It looks like Batman. It's like a rubber cape top and then a long down on the bottom. And then it's, and it's, and it's red canvas on the inside. So you almost look like, uh, like, a, like, a, like a bishop from Rome in a Batman costume. <laughs> and I, it's the only thing I kept on campus, you know? So when it was raining out, I would put on my, like, my cool, you know, military raincoat with the black, you know, the, the black top, and I'd flip it back over my shoulders, and it was the red canvas on the inside. So they thought that I was like Anton LaVey taking over the campus. <laughs> but we had Holy Ghost meetings in my room, and uh, we were just like the curse in the campus, because there'd be beer parties in the hall. And we'd be in that room praying in the Holy Ghost. I mean, I didn't know much, but I knew we were going to take authority over the devil. We're not going to have any fornicating spirits in here. Man, I, I, we just took authority over every demon I could think of, and I got the football team saved. That was really what freaked them out. I got the quarterback, the halfback, and the center. Because for some reason, in God's sense, he put me with all the athletes. And I'm the entertainer. So I got them all saved. And they would have beer cake parties in the hall. And then we'd pray until we heard this. This party stinks. As soon as I heard this party, we celebrate. Oh, hallelujah. We were like, the curse. Then they try to figure out what was going on. They find that and our room was packed full. We were like having a party in our room. People would come in and we'd get them saved. We had one seat where, where I got people saved on. I don't know why it was, but we put like a prayer, prayer napkin underneath the seat. And uh, we knew when anyone sat in that seat, we call it the Holy Ghost hot seat. They'd get convicted. They'd come in checking us out, checking out the cult movement. And, you know, and then the center, you know, would be praying. And his name was Mongo, uh, based on Blazing Saddles or something like that. But these guys were uh, J Joe Beasley, who was backslid from Pittsburgh. Now, Neil Forsberg, he was like the star athlete on the football team. We got him saved. He thought I was a drug runner. Because I'd go to these Holy Ghost meetings and off the campus, these prayer meetings, and I'd come back with my Bible. And I come back, and he's watching me coming back, and he'd run into me in the hallway, and he'd see my eyes all lit up, and I'm all like, like I'm jacked up on some drugs or something. <laughs> and so one day he stops me, he goes, hey, 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 Lance, I'm on to your game. I go, what's that, Neil? He goes, I know what you're doing. 
what am I doing, Neil? He goes, you're taking off all the time. I see you hop in those cars, take off, then you come back. The Bible, I know what you got. What do you mean, Neil? The drugs are in the Bible. It's okay. <laughs> I won't tell a soul. Because he was, he was a dealer on the campus. He thought I was his competition. I go, no, Neil. I... By the way, I met him at one of Karis event. He came to a Karis event. <laughs> So he comes up, he goes, it's true, isn't it? I go, no, Neil, I mean, I, I'm going to a Bible study and prayer meeting. He goes, right, right, okay, it's cool. Let me see the Bible. I hand the Bible. He was like befuddled, you know, it's pages. He's looking through it, like, where's the compartment? It's like, you know, line upon line. <laughs> Precept upon precept. <laughs> so he goes, are you for real? He goes, you're high as a kite. I go, I am, Neil. I really am. It's the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Holy what? I said, come on into my room. Get him saved. Get him filled with the Spirit. Now, it was no wonder I became a target on campus. I was getting all the celebrities saved. Then I got kicked off. And I, and I realized something that, you know, I could pray for wisdom, but I wasn't doing so good academically. But I love that idea of prayer because I was bored with classes. The classes all seemed stupid. Now, I'm trying to tell you something. I'm trying to go somewhere for a reason. I only wanted to be like Andrew. I just wanted to have the Word and just be an evangelist, soul winner, missionary, Bible. That's all I wanted to do. And the world, I had a contempt for the world system because the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And I could see very quickly. I was raised in affluence, raised in, and, and, and with academics and all that stuff. And I remember my, one of my favorite verses, that which is highly esteemed in the sight of men is an abomination in the sight of God. That's such a great verse when people are trying to throw at you, you need to get your degree, you need to get your, you know, make a living. That which is highly esteemed in the sight of men is an abomination in the sight of God. I felt really sanctified when I quoted that. <laughs> but then I found out that, that uh, I was the perfect candidate for God to give a seven mountain revelation to. Because I, I was a rich young ruler, I left it all. I worked for my dad in the oil business, and I actually worked for him for a while in the oil business, and, and, and I made great money uh, in the oil business. But then I got convicted one day that I really didn't want to do that. I really wanted this where Annabelle and I were dating, and she got saved and filled with the Spirit. Now, she's a story because her parents and my parents were like best friends. So her parents and my parents, Dr. Naples and Mr. Wall, my dad had the oil company. Her dad was a doctor, obstetrician, gynecologist, and, and uh, everybody knew Dr. Naples. And we were in Levittown, Pennsylvania. We were, there were GIs that came over after World War II and kind of built America. And uh, Annabelle was their daughter. And my mom wanted me to get together with one of the Naples girls because she had these sisters. And she was, I have two brothers. She was always trying to mix and match, almost, you know, trying to figure out how to get us together. And we knew what she was up to. We were always entertained because we all liked the family. The families were friends. And then she heard that I became a Jesus freak and was regretting the fact that I was such a great guy and then I became religious. Then I went over to, 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 to connect with, well, actually my mother was a large part of it. I don't want to go into the personal story here, but I had a date with a switchboard operator in my dad's oil company. I was, wasn't that sanctified at that time. I liked Holly Berryman. Holly Berryman was a switchboard operator. I was single. And, uh, and I can remember, well, I like Holly. And uh, I invited her over to uh, my parents' house uh, for uh, my dad's to have these uh, cocktail parties. And I thought, well, why don't you come over to my dad's parties and, you know, we'll hang out. And my mother told me to break the date with that bimbo because Dr. Naples is going to bring one of his daughters over. <laughs> my mom interfered with all my plans and she said, Annabelle's going to come over. So Annabelle came over and the night that Annabelle came over, we just became like best friends that night. We were best friends. She says we were dating. I didn't know it. We were best friends for like two or three years. Because I like being with her more than anybody else. She was more fun. If you ever hang around with her, she's a lot of fun. And so, uh, and so, but she lived in a house that was haunted. Her parents were trying to sell this house. It was like in the 1600s. William Penn built it, or William Penn Gardner put the, the estate there. It's a big house there. How many rooms was that? 18 rooms. So she was all by herself in that great big house. In that, and when she got saved, all the demons manifested in the house. So, I mean, I come over there and say, hey, we don't talk to her. And also I hear doors slamming in the house. I go, what's that? She goes, oh, it's them. I go, who's them? She goes, them, the spirits, they don't like you. They don't like this Jesus thing either. I go, what? I hear boom, door, and she's yelling, shut up. 
<laughs> I, th- I said, that's... <laughs> now, I'm talking about our eccentric tribe, just to give you some background here. So uh, I go, how can you... You can't yell, shut up, and demons. You have to take authority over them in the name of Jesus. I'll show you how to do it. In the name of Jesus, I bind you, shall I manifest. Boop, doors kept slamming. I thought I was really humiliated right then. I thought, well, maybe these are old spirits. I got to take a little more fasting and prayer time. <laughs> Get my Lester Summerall teaching out here, see what I got to do. <laughs> anyway, so I had an old Pentecostal, cranky old Pentecostal pastor that I loved, who was my first, first pastor. And he was kind of tough. He was like, he was like a, a Marine. He was, he was always, he was, he was the right kind of guy to have as my first pastor. He couldn't pastor a big church. He only had seven people, but I was one of them. He kept weeding the crowd out. He said, everybody's full of compromise. Everybody's carnal. And so, so he kept, you know, that's not how you build a following, everybody. So he'd always tell me, you know what you got to be? You're going to be one of those country club Christians. That's what you're going to be. Okay, no, I'm not going to be a country club. I was trying to be like a real Marine back then. Anyway, when I went into business, in the oil business, making all that money, he and I fell out of fellowship because he thought I was walking away from God and pursuing worldly affairs. I really was. I was trying to get away from him. But I got convicted because he's the only pastor I really knew. I, was, I didn't have a whole lot. There's not any churches in Levittown, Pennsylvania back then. And he's the only pastor I knew. And, and I felt convicted because I made all this money and I, need, and I used to tithe and I used to, it used to support our little church. I was the guy that paid the bills for the church, so I left. So I, Lord convicted me. Now, here's the funny thing. When you get backslid and people get right with the Lord, if we have an altar call now and you're backslid, now you don't have to do this, but you want to talk about your conscience? I was back for like about a year. I really was. It was like I wasn't going to church. I was just buried myself in business and got into work. And I didn't know, because I, I had all that legalism. So everywhere I went, I was poisoned. They were all compromised. So you, I got cut myself off from healthy fellowship with other Christians because I was always critical. Nobody was ever dedicated, pure, and holy enough, including me. So I turned on myself. I said, you're, you're probably going to hell. Yeah, you probably better bury yourself in work, man. It's a painful thought. You're going to hell. So after I got the Lord, I got reconnected with the Lord. Annabelle gets saved, filled with the Spirit. I want, I want him, Victor, to go meet Annabelle. I want her to get filled with the Holy Ghost and, you know, get connected. And I didn't know where to go. I'm just going back to my roots with my old pastor. And I felt like I had not tithed in a year, so I owed back tithes. Now, how about that for conviction? It's like the Lord said, well, you were, you were, you were walking away for a whole year, weren't you? I said, yes, sir. I said, but uh, you weren't even giving for a whole year, were you? I said, no, sure. The Lord said, well, what are we going to do about that? <laughs> now, you know you're hearing God when God tells you to pay your back tithe. <laughs> Most Christians wouldn't even think about that. They think, oh, let's we'll start right here. Oh. My Jewish forefathers came back in my DNA and they said, you owe the Lord something. <laughs> and so I put all this cash in an attache case, like a, almost like a drug deal. I got all this cash. <laughs> It was a whole year's worth of tithes, and I called up my dear old pastor, who never saw that much money in his life, legalistic, sweet man of God that he was, and I, he really was just, he was like the great Santini. He was just not meant to pastor, that was all. <laughs> he comes over and meets me. I flip open the, the briefcase, and it's loaded, stacked with cash. First time in my life, I saw him break out crying. He had never seen that in his life. He said, my God, this is, this, who, what's this for? I go, it's for you, man. I'll, it's my back tithe. I, I've been backslid. <laughs> I owe you this, I owe, you know, and you got to steward this for the kingdom now. It's out, off of my hands, it's in your hands. And he broke down and cried. Well, that was a beautiful moment with, with you know, for, for me and for him. And he comes to, he says, well, I still want you to meet uh, Annabelle. So he comes to meet Annabelle. He walks into the, into the house and uh, he freezes at the door because he had discerning spirits. He really was kind of an unusual guy. He could see the two spirits that were in her house that were slamming the doors. And so he comes in, he goes, whoa, he stops. He says, I don't know if I'm coming in. And I'm standing there, I don't see a thing. I'm going, what are you talking about? You got that far, you drove all the way from Lancaster, walk in. He goes, I think we have some company here. <laughs> There's Annabelle sitting there, got a little flower in her head, you know, and hippie self that she is. And she goes, so you see him? <laughs> I don't know what they're talking about. I go, see what? He goes, yeah, I see him. And then Annabelle's checking him out. She goes, oh, yeah? She's chewing gum. What do they look like? <laughs> he goes, 
Well, one of them looks like uh, Abe Lincoln there with a top hat, and the other one looks like it's shaped like a Christmas tree with a little pinhead. She goes, yep, that's them. <laughs> I don't know what either of them are talking about. I can't see them. I don't know what you're talking about. All I know is he sees them. She goes, yeah, that's them. Because she, her family, they're, it's familiar spirits. This is weird. All her family is these professors, Princeton professors, Rutgers professors, Philadelphia colleges. They're all a bunch of professors. Yeah, they, they saw those spirits in that house. They, I don't know how they, how they reconcile that now with being, you know, intellectual, but their spirit, they knew what they looked like in their family. They'd show up, like the grandmother talked to them. So uh, anyway, we ended up having to, having to get rid of those spirits. Do you want to know how we did it? Ever have Alexander Scurry? I, I had the Bible, the Bible on tape. And since uh, we wouldn't get those, I couldn't get those spirits to shut up. I, would to, I told them, I said, I'm going to marinate you night and day with the word of God. <laughs> this is crazy, huh? I put Alexander Scurvy sucking down the Lord. He talks like this and he would do narrating the New Testament in a perfect British accent. And Jesus went to the land of Sidon and crossed over into Gennesaret. And there he was met by two fierce demons. And so I put it on, and it was one of those reversible cassette players, so it would just play 24 hours a day. And Annabelle and I go to work, we marinate that house with Alexander Scurvy and the King James Version of the Bible for 24 hours a day. We change the tape every day just to give them a little variety on the scripture. <laughs> Wanted to make sure they had the whole counsel of God. Do you want to know what happened? Huh? Took seven days. By the seventh day, not a peep. I said, hello? Hello, hello? They were like, shut up, don't say a thing. So we stopped marinating them with the Word of God, and then we ended up having to sell that, sell that place. But when you start off like that, there's no such thing as a normal life. That's my point. So I go, I go to Annabelle, I go, now, honey, you have to understand something. I'm going to be mentoring you now. I've been around this thing longer than you. I'm going to teach you a few things. We're going to have to live by faith. Now, I know that this will be a surprise to you, but we're going to have to believe God because once I leave that oil company thing, it's going to be trusting God. And, you know, I want you to get some, got some Hagen things here and Copeland things. Why don't you be meditating? He goes, oh, yeah, I know all about that. I go, yeah, you know all about that. I'm talking about believing God for rent, believing God for everything. She goes, yeah, 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 I did that already. I go, you didn't do that already? I just, you just, I just led you to the Lord. She goes, oh, no, no. She goes, I understand what you're talking about. I don't know how this works, but I get it. Because when I was in college, my, my roommate was a Jamaican witch, and we put a spell on our landlord, and he never collected our rent. So wait a second, because I was paying my pastor's rent for like five years with my tithe. I knew how hard it was to get God to show up and pay the bill if it wasn't working right. I said, let me get this straight. Where were you living again? She said, right there in Benefit Street in that beautiful apartment overlooking Providence, Rhode Island. It was the former hospital converted into an apartment complex. We had the top room with the skylights where they did surgery. We just took authority over. I said, who was the landlord? It was Sid Blazer, the stingiest Jewish landlord in Providence. Now, I know it's a miracle. Sid, I said, well, what happened? She goes, well, we put a spell on him. He never collected rent because we bound his mind. <laughs> so I think I get a little bit of how this works. I mean, it isn't the same thing, but I mean, I get it. Oh, my God, this is bizarre. She's got more faith for God to pay the rent than me. So I said, well, what did you do? How, what happened? She goes, well, I got convicted. So I told Sid, I go, Sid, I feel sorry about this. I put a spell on. He never collected my rent. He goes, that, he laughed. That's ridiculous. A couple minutes later, knocking on the door. Hey, you owe me a lot of money. He went back and checked that out. She said, I know, Sid. Remember, I told you I put the spell on you. <laughs> That's, this is a crazy chapter if you think about it. So she went home 
because she was in debt and she had to get her life together. That's how come she was in proximity to me when I was home and, we, and my parents were able to connect us together. And she was the one. And I always prayed about certain things. I prayed for three things. That God would give me his perfect will in marriage, perfect thing in ministry, and perfect thing in work. At that point in time, I didn't have a, a, a concept about work because I thought, as many of you, that my goal was to escape the world system and just live in the spirit. And that's why I want to get real quick in my last couple of minutes on, the, on, the, on this worldview about the seven mountains of culture. Because it makes sense that God would give me that because I'm the guy that was like, I left the money and the family to go live by faith and moved out and tried to do this thing, you know, uh, as a totally dedicated evangelist for revival just thinking soul winning was the only thing that was important and evangelism. And so I pulled myself out of the world system, seeing the world system as all of the enemy. And that was when I think the Lord began to open up my eyes to say, I want you to present a fresh paradigm to the church regarding the world and the kingdom. Because too many of my people are disengaged from the occupation. I mean, you're just looking for the call of God. And if the devil can convince you that God doesn't want you in business, God doesn't want you in media, God doesn't want you in arts, if you see it all as the world system and you're trying to escape it, you're never going to go into it. Did you enjoy this latest episode? Please remember to share it with your friends because the more knowledge you have, the better equipped you are to navigate the world. See you tomorrow. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, and in light of the recent events, your continued support means everything to myself and my employees. To thank you for having the biggest sale ever on all my pillow bedding. Get my pillow bed sheets for as low as $29.98, a set of pillowcases for only $9.98. In this economy, instead of buying a new bed, rejuvenate your bed with a my pillow mattress topper for as low as $99.99. We also have blankets in a variety of sizes, colors, and styles, like plush, waffle, or gossamer, for as low as $29.98. We even have pet blankets from small size to the ones for your car. Get huge discounts on duvets, quilts, down comforters, and so much more. So go to MyPillow.com or call that number on your screen. Use your promo code and you'll get huge discounts on all MyPillow bedding, including MyPillow bed sheets for as low as $29.98.